Good morning. Once again, I'm Council Member Adenique Miller, Chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. I'd like to thank all those who have come to this hearing today and all those who are prepared to testify. In addition, I'd like to welcome my colleagues, Council Member Drum, Council Member Adams, Council Member Lewis, for being with us today. Today we will be holding a hearing to examine automation within the New York City labor force. <clears throat> automation is the creation of the application of technology to better monitor and control how we produce and deliver products and services. Technology and automation have been a part of the labor force for as long as both have existed. It is now, it is not a new concept. However, we are at a point in time in which technology is increasingly rapidly and, and extremely complex with artificial intelligence and machines having amazing abilities, learning and adapting on the go. Every industry from factories to hospitals to construction sites will be impacted over the next wave of technology and advancements in automation. Emerging technologies will impact the way in which jobs and industries are performed, as well as how human workers work. Although these advancements may displace a number of workers, there is also a possibility that new fields and jobs will emerge as a result of this technology. This is the impetus of this hearing. To understand the New York City labor force will be how it will be impacted by technology and automation for better or worse. Today's committee will examine the city's private companies are preparing for for automation in a way that will ensure that the human labor is complemented by automation rather than taken away. Notably, an in-depth analysis by the Center of Urban Future found that New York City is far less susceptible to automation than the nation as a whole. Although susceptible, more than 456,000 jobs in New York City will be largely automated using te technology that exists today. At least 80% of the associated tasks, associated tasks and jobs could be performed by machines. Fields such as bookkeeping, accounting, auditing, clerks will become highly automated, while some such as caregiving will not. As the strongest effects on automations are on low and middle class or low wage workers, we want to ensure that those workers in these fields are not replaced by machines. At the end of the day, we want to strike a balance between technology, innovation, and human work. The interaction and the presence of our workforce is pivotal. I'd like to thank the Department of Small Business Services and, and DCAS for accepting the committee's invitation to participate in today's hearing. However, I am disappointed that their colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development and the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection opted not to join us here today. Whether we study this issue now or 10 years into the future, automation will continue to become a reality in this city. The growing use of automation in the workforce has been spurred not only by technology advances, but also the desire to minimize costs and achieve greater efficiencies and simply by simplifying the process. We have a responsibility to keep our finger on the pulse of, of our city's workforce in order to understand what factors are being played with automation and its concerns, as well as how do we go forward in educating, training, and preparing our workforce for necessary transitions. But the administration's limited presence at this hearing suggests that the city is taking a passive instead of prudent approach to this dynamic. Today, the committee will examine the positive and negative impacts of automation on employment and the workforce throughout our city, while examining ways in which to lessen the associated negative impacts associated with automation. The committee wants to hear from the city as to what it is doing to address the future needs, if any, and if not, why are they not looking forward to uh, addressing the future needs of our workforce. I also look forward to hearing from Research Institute labor economic, economist 
and private companies testifying today on how they are addressing automation within their perspective and respective industries. Uh, I'd like to thank my staff, Brandon Clark, Ali DeSilenzeb, Joe Goldblum, Bloomberg, Cole Bloom, as well as uh, Nutset from the committee staff, Kevin, Kendall, and Elizabeth. Once again, I thank my colleagues for being here, um, and we look forward to uh, hearing from testimony from all those who will testify here today. Uh, with that being said, uh, with the council swearing in, first panel. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Good. All right. You're up, sir. All right. Well, good morning, Chair Miller and members of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. My name is Greg Bishop, and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. At Small Business Services, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. I'm joined by my colleague, Bar Barbara Danningbury, the Deputy Commissioner of Human Capital from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Automation, technology, automation technologies are already impacting business operations and the value of workforce skill sets. SBS resources for small businesses and job seekers are informed by industry demand and changing market conditions, including the current and future impact of automation. Annually, SBS provides free, high-quality services to around 20,000 small businesses and more than 25,000 job seekers. SBS's workforce strategy aims to connect New Yorkers to quality jobs with real advancement opportunities. Through our network of 18 Workforce One centers, SBS connects job seekers with employment opportunities, industry-informed trainings, and a variety of candidate development services, such as resume development, interview preparation, and job search workshops. To inform this work and ensure that we are preparing New Yorkers to enter growing sectors of the economy, the administration launched, launched our industry partnerships in sectors including food service, healthcare, technology, industrial manufacturing, and construction. These industry partnerships bring businesses, community groups, training providers, academic institutions, and government together to recruit, train, and connect unemployed and underemployed adults to quality jobs. Through their collaborative model, the industry partnerships allow SBS to work closely with industry to understand and respond directly to their workforce needs. As automation is incorporated in business operation and impacts workforce opportunities, these industry partnerships allow SBS to hear directly from employers regarding industry trends and adjust training modules we offer based on this information. In sectors that are already being impacted by automation, SBS offers trainings to help New Yorkers develop the skills needed to seize emerging new opportunities. The onset of automation is not projected to impede the continued growth of jobs in certain sectors of the economy, such as healthcare and technology. SBS is working with these industries to create pathways to opportunities that are accessible to New Yorkers with a wide range of experience levels to foster a diverse and equitable, accessible future workforce. SBS's Healthcare in Industry Partnership, the New York Alliance for Careers in Healthcare, or NIACH, works with industry partners to identify pressing workforce needs and supports training initiatives that provide viable career opportunities for low-income and underemployed New Yorkers. NIACH is responding to rel relevant changing market forces by preparing job seekers and the current workforce with the core competencies needed to excel in person-centered roles that are not expected to be displaced by automation. For example, NIAT supported the development of the Certified Recovery Peer Advocate Training Program at Queensborough Community College. This program has trained over 110 students with lived experience with substance abuse and recovery to support others with similar diagnosis. Caregiving and human connection are fundamental to the performance of these peer specialist occupations, jobs which are expected to continue to grow in the future. NIH is also ensuring that the future of healthcare workforce is prepared with the new technology skills and knowledge that will be needed to succeed in a more automated and technology reliant healthcare system. New York City's grown tech ecosystem is made up of more than 320,000 jobs across five boroughs, and SBS is working to ensure all New Yorkers can participate in this important sector of the economy. 
The city's tech industry partnership, Tech Talent Pipeline, or TTP, was launched in May 2014 to support the inclusive growth of the city's tech sector. TTP works with the industry, public, the educational, and community partners to align New York City's infrastructure with the ever-evolving needs of the tech ecosystem so that New Yorkers today and the future can succeed in the growing tech economy. Opportunities provided by TGP include support for CUNY students to increase their access to jobs at leading tech companies and pre-training programs in web development to help those with no experience forge a path to employment in the tech sector. Automation will continue to change the operations and workforce needs of growing sectors so that, such as food service, construction, and in industrial. Through our industry partnerships in these sectors, SBS is working closely with businesses and industry experts to meet current needs and strengthen the pathways of communication between government, industry, and academia to prepare for future workforce demands. Many in, in industrial processes are already being automated through techno technological advancements. These advancements increase efficiency and safety in the industrial and manufacturing sectors, and SBS is working closely with industry to ensure that these changes come with new career opportunities for New Yorkers. Through our industrial IP, the Manufacturing and Industrial Innovation Council, or MAKE, SBS is training New Yorkers to perform jobs producing, operating, maintaining, and repairing these new automated technologies. Last year, SBS launched Apprentice NYC, Apprentice NYC an employer partnership program model that will provide New Yorkers with career opportunities in sectors including tech, healthcare, life sciences, and industrial and manufacturing. Three cohorts of Apprentice NYC's first iteration have provided participants with the skills, training, necessary, uh, required to become computer numerical control machinists, or CNC machinists. CNC machinists operate advanced manufacturing technologies to produce parts for industrial companies ranging from furniture manufacturers to aerospace engineering firms. Apprentice NYC provides participating New Yorkers with technical hands-on instructions, on-the-job training, and employment with participating employer partners. Furthermore, apprentices are paid during the, both the classroom learning and on-the-job training components of the program. Apprentice NYC will soon be launching additional occupational apprenticeships in the transportation industry to connect New Yorkers with the new skills required to succeed as this industry advances. As in the industrial sector, the landscape of brick and mortar business is continually evolving. SBS aims to help business owners adapt to changing market conditions. SBS recently expanded and updated our business education courses offering through our net, offered through our network of seven business solution centers. Many of these courses help small business owners learn how to utilize automation technologies such as accounting software, uh, customer relations management or CRM systems, and email marketing to enable their businesses to operate more efficiently. We are also providing business owners with the opportunities to implement those automa automation solutions through our Love Your Local Business Preparedness and Resiliency pro uh, Program and Customized Training Grant Programs. Through two rounds of Love Your Local Grant Program, almost 40 small businesses were awarded funding and consultations with business consultants to help them adapt to change in market conditions. This initiative will enable SBS to test and analyze creative business interventions, including automation technologies, with the aim of expanding effective solutions to other long-standing businesses across the five boroughs. All of SBS's services help business owners start, operate, and grow more effectively. We look forward to continuing to help small business owners learn about and utilize these new technologies so that they continue to thrive in our city. Like many dramatic shifts in our economy, automation is projected to have the strongest impact on low and middle income jobs. Using the knowledge gained through our industry partnerships, SBS is committed to working with employers, local organizations, and training providers to create workforce and training opportunities with a variety of entry points to ensure that New Yorkers with different levels of experience can advance in our economy. We look forward to continue, continuing to work with Council to empower New Yorkers to be resilient to future economic trends, including automation. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so your testimony, a lot of it, you covered a lot of ground, glad to say, and, and that you kind of brought up some of the things that uh, we had anticipated that we'd be hearing from workforce development. But without them being there, I don't know how far we can actually dive into that. Um, but you, you, a lot of your testimony was specific to 
your area of expertise, which is which is small businesses, and and how do we support small business with uh, additional technologies and and resources um, that are available? Is this um, in an attempt to assist them to not just maintain but to grow and to be able to grow their workforce. Obviously, uh, the larger concern is is um, the workforce, and 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 whether or not these small businesses uh, through the, these new practices and technology automation are reducing the number of the workforce or they're operating cohesively and more efficiently. Um, could could you? kind of I express and, and give an example of, of what that would look like? Yeah, so, uh, so a couple things, and um, I, I wanted to just remind the council that uh, even though our name is Small Business Services, our largest division at SBS is actually Workforce, um, which is why the Office of Workforce Development, uh, we work closely with the Office of Workforce Development to focus on adult workforce, um, and we also work closely uh, through our industry partnerships uh, not only with the Department of Education, uh, but also with the Department of Youth and Community Development, and also with CUNY. Um, we are uh, all partners in ensuring that our workforce is prepared for the change, the, the changing uh, skill sets that our industry uh, requires. Uh, the industry par partnership um, initiative, even though it lives at SBS, uh, all the information that's gathered by the industry partnerships is shared throughout uh, our workforce system, and the Office of Workforce Development ensures that that happens. Um, so I just wanted to give some color there so you understand how uh, the workforce is situated here in New York City. Um, you know, one of the things that we have heard um, from our small businesses, actually automation, uh, to your point, uh, to the latter point, actually will make them more efficient. Uh, most of the small businesses in New York City have, you know, five or less employees. Um, and as you know uh, from even walking with you in different corridors, uh, you know, the principal who's running the business is also the, the accountant, is also the, you know, the janitor is also, they're doing multiple jobs. Uh, so if we can actually con connect them to technology, uh, they can actually run their businesses more efficient. And the goal there is actually to help them grow their business so then they can add more employees. Uh, what we are doing um, on the workforce side is ensuring that there's a connection between the industry and especially those industries that are being uh, um, transformed by automation. There's a connection between the skill sets that they will need in the future. Uh, so when I mention the industrial, um, our industry partnership in industrial and manufacturing, uh, the industrial sector is changing uh, because of technology. Uh, the workforce is, uh, we say it's a silver tsunami, so the workforce is aging out. Um, and we want to make sure that the new workforce uh, understands um, that sector uh, has the ab ability to create uh, not only meaningful jobs, but well-paying jobs. Um, so some of the things that we understand is that the new generation, they're not looking at in industrial and manufacturing as a career opportunity. Uh, so how can we change the message around that? Uh, we're looking at how do we uh, connect uh, opportunities um, in low to moderate income areas, uh, well, uh, opportunities from the industrial and manufacturing sector to individuals in low to moderate income areas. Uh, so there's a number of programs that I talked about um, that we're doing to ensure that uh, we're taking and leveraging uh, automation and turning it into a, uh, an opportunity for a, a lot of our low to moderate income uh, communities. So in the, I know you've had, a, we've had this conversation over, over the past few years Councilmember Adams and I have had this conversation that because we, we represent an area out by the JFK Airport and Councilmember Drum by, by LaGuardia. These are um, areas that are, are known for their warehousing and logistical mm -hmm. operations out there. And oftentimes, communities have not been able to take full um, advantage of, of those employment opportunities. Oftentimes, I was told that, that um, as far as logistics were concerned, that local residents did not necessarily have the skill set that was necessary, that they were decent paying jobs, more than decent paying jobs, um, but they were having difficulty bringing people in because of transportation proximities, but yet they didn't have the skills from the local residents to be able to do it. So one of the things I know that we have discussed over the years is, is um, some specific training mm -hmm. um, for, for the communities that could take advantage of that. But now are we seeing, uh, with the advent of new technology, we know that there are a number of the larger, 
logistic uh, warehousing folks that are, are using robotics and, and things of that nature there. Have we seen an impact? Did we kind of miss the mark on that? Or is there still opportunity for us to get in and, and really take advantage of those opportunities? Yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't um, I, we have not seen, um, uh, we have not missed the mark. I think what we've seen is a, a shift in, in terms of the skill sets um, that individuals need. And, and to your point, uh, part of creating uh, the Industrial Manufacturing Council uh, was to bring a lot of these companies to the table to understand uh, their workforce projections, you know, not only a year from now, but three years from now, um, and then working closely um, with those companies uh, to create uh, either apprenticeship programs or figure out what we need to do in our education system. So a good example, and we use this as uh, sort of the template, a good example is uh, the tech sector. Um, so we brought together uh, a lot of the major tech companies uh, and also a lot of um, the uh, a couple of presidents from uh, our public universities and our private universities uh, at the table. Um, and we questioned why those companies were not recruiting, why they weren't hiring um, individuals from those universities. Because as you know, New York City has a diverse workforce. Uh, our, edu our CUNY system has a diversity of students, and if our tech companies are looking to grow diversity, uh, that is a natural fit. Uh, but what we heard was there was a disconnect between the, the curriculum that the students were, um, you know, had to go through at the CUNY schools and the experience that those students ultimately got in terms of internships, et cetera, uh, that there was a disconnect based on the new changes in um, how tech companies are designing. Um, you know, they were looking for students that uh, knew how to work in groups. They were looking for students who understood agile development, et cetera, and our CUNY students did not have that. So that's why we launched uh, CUNY 2X, uh, to help double the amount of computer science graduates going, coming out from schools, but then we were able to connect individuals from the industry directly to the schools. Uh, so we're looking to do the same uh, with the industrial manufacturing sector. Uh, we're looking to deepen our tentacles in uh, our local communities. Uh, so uh, we've expanded the amount of industrial and manufacturing um, uh, specific uh, workforce centers. Um, and we've actually expanded the amount of um, partners that we work with to ensure that when we hear about an opportunity, um, we find individuals with the skill sets that's necessary. So uh, the conversation is still, and the work is still ongoing. Um, you know, the council meets uh, on a semi-annual basis and we are using the data that we're getting from the industry uh, to pivot either our outreach strategy or our, our training strategy. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you kind of pivoted and, and kind of brought it back home to talk about those specific industries that, that were not necessarily um, where we were recruiting from our local universities, but the, the lower skill workers that were currently in there that, that either did not have the skill to take advantage, and we've been joined by Councilmember Moya, mm -hmm. who is also a, uh, represents the, uh, the LaGuardia Air Airport area. So we, we have the, the two airports here covered and uh, pretty much the logistics industry. And, and we really would like to see how um, we could take advantage of that, whether or not it is uh, something that is passed us by or something that there's real remains opportunity for us for, for some training um, and, and uh, technology that would provide uh, greater access for employment for, for our local residents there. Um, so uh, uh, I bought M uh, Michaela Crater, who is the executive director uh, for mm -hmm. the Industrial and Manufacturing Indu Industry Partnership. Um, and she could talk specifically about the logistics and, and some of the things that we're seeing. Sure. Good morning. Uh, some of the things we're seeing is, as you're probably pointing out and the p purpose of this conversation is how technology is being embedded in different industries. And so a lot of companies are using other forms of logistics software and oftentimes what they call cobots to manage the different inventory systems. Um, so we are seeing more and more companies trying to think how to improve efficiency when it comes to logistics firms. Yes, you do need to be sworn in. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. 
Ms. Matuni. So, um, so it's interesting, we see a lot of these um, newer companies coming up with the technology. The larger challenge is the existing companies, more legacy firms that are probably within your neighborhood. They are having clients or customers wanting them to use more technology, but they're not necessarily best set, it, set up for it. So some of the larger work we've been doing with our manufacturers that we now look to do with our logistic firms is figuring out how to bridge that divide. But in the meantime, take advantage of understanding what are the skills and works, um, work skills that the new um, work employment opportunities that these, um, as we adopt new technologies, what does that mean for the workforce? And then structuring simultaneously the training programs that would help sort of bring those new um, in employment opportunities for new individuals. Um, what we notice again is there's a large aging out population, so and the opportunity when those individuals leave is to have a new guard of different young uh, individuals or just any individual who already knows that technology, so it's not, the learning curve is not as large, and they've already sort of embedded with that skill set. Um, what we also know as a whole with industrial companies is while there's still entry-level jobs, the, the bar has risen as technology is just more and more embedded into the norms of companies across the industrial sector. So while um, in the past, if you worked in your parents' car or in the garage or you went to a vocational school, those there are less opportunities like that today, which is why apprenticeships and what we've been doing at SBS is so important because um, we have to bridge that gap. At the same time, companies are small, so they don't always have the resources and the structure in place to train um, with very specific ways for the technology, and that's where, again, apprenticeship and creating a, a public-private partnership is mission critical. So, uh, so our residents should be able to walk into a workforce development center somewhere in Queens and be able to access um, these resources, having opportunities to, for, for these apprenticeships? Currently. Yep, yeah, so definitely, the, currently they could. We just had about eight different information sessions for our CNC apprenticeship program. We screened over 400 people for 20, uh, 19 positions. Um, most of those individuals have zero experience working, um, minimal experience working in a manufacturing environment. So the apprenticeship program is structured so that they get upfront training, hands-on training, and then um, a year and a half worth of on-the-job training. We work with employers to con codify what it is they'll be teaching the person. Um, as they get the skills to be uh, what is an entry-level CNC machinist. We'll be doing the same thing for the transportation industry, for um, what is called diesel technicians, individuals who fix diesel engines. Um, but what's important and, and sort of the larger thing is like we have to do that and pace it with where the industry is going. Um, as policies made um, thinking about clean technology and affecting the transportation industry, we don't want to train people for jobs that are not going to be around. So we have to be very active in our curriculum, modify it on a regular basis so that the skill sets um, that these apprentices are gaining help open the broader spectrum of opportunity. So, and, and I just, I'm gonna pass it on to, to my colleagues here. Um, but again, I just wanna make sure that we're taking, because I know that this was, this was a conversation that, that industry folks came to us with even before the technological changes, just the fact that they could not uh, attract and retain a workforce. Uh, airports are often difficult to get to, and if you're not a local resident, it's very hard to attract talent from the outside, and whether or not that, that skill set happened. If it, have we identified very specifically, not just a, a, b broadly an industry, but, but uh, uh, industry players that are willing to be partners in this, and, and what roles very specifically are, are we playing and assisting them and in, in, uh, not just providing the work source, workforce, but the resources. Um, I, I know in the past there was some, uh, uh, we had conversations about creating workforce development around logistics um, with, with, with in, in this case, of York College and, and, and some other folks that could provide the, the training. Um, but obviously, whether it's Queensborough or anybody else, it's, 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 I think it was an, a really missed opportunity for us. And um, we're talking broadly uh, uh, about uh, technology and, and, and various industries. I wanna make sure that we're taking advantage of this. And if so, or if not, what could we specifically, the members do to continue to assist in, in um, making that happen? So a, a couple things, and uh, I think you're hitting on some great points. Number one, with um, 
with our outreach, we want to make sure that we we get into all the communities. Um, so thank you in, in advance for helping us whenever we have any of the training. Uh, we mm -hmm. do send out uh, information to all the council members, uh, but we also send it to through a network of, of area partners. Uh, so in, individual partners that are embedded in the community, uh, they know that this training is about to, we're about to do the recruiting. Um, and we've actually had some really great response. I think what we're seeing uh, in general, and uh, I'll ask Michaela to go into more details, is that there's a misunderstanding of what this industry, what the sector is. Um, and, and one of the things that we are, and we're hearing the same thing from the companies that we're talking to, uh, the difficulty of recruiting is based on the fact that individuals still think, uh, for in specifically industrial and manufacturing, is still sort of like the old type of industrial and manufacturing. Uh, it's dangerous. It's, I mean, it's there's some Labor danger intensive. to it, but you know, it's 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 not like you're going to lose a limb. Uh, well, you could probably still lose a limb, but it's it's <laughs> not it's it's not the sort of the old school um, industrial and manufacturing. Uh, in, in industrial manufacturing has changed to more modern manufacturing, um, and one of the, one of the things that we heard um, was uh, a an ask from the industry to help them rebrand, uh, really, to help them uh, communicate what it is that's different and how it's different. And now it's mainly, you know, heavy on math and science in terms of individuals just programming and babysitting machines who are now doing most of the work that was done uh, by hand. Uh, so how you can help us is, you know, if, if there are companies that are coming to you saying that they cannot find, and we, we get this all the time. There's, you know, tech companies that come to us and say they're looking for a particular skill. If there are companies that are coming to you saying they cannot find uh, individuals with a particular skill set, refer them to us um, because we will get a better understanding of the skills that they need. And in some cases, um, our apprenticeship program, just to give you an example, came about because we had uh, uh, companies in the aerospace industry that literally was turning down contracts uh, from Boeing, uh, from the military, because they didn't have a workforce. And these companies were literally two or three blocks from public housing. Uh, and we have public housing uh, young people who just did not have jobs and were idle. Uh, so there was a desire to make that connection and, and figure out how we can actually bring someone uh, from uh, public housing, uh, get them to have the uh, uh, the skills that the company would, would need, and that's how we came up with um, our, our apprenticeship program for computer numerical uh, for CNC machinists. Uh, so, the, so we heard from the, the industry. Uh, so, if you tell us who they are, we more than happy to, to work with them. Yes. Councilmember Ann. Thank you, Chair Miller. Good morning, and thank you, panel, for being here today. I, I, we've we've touched on a lot so far. Um, I'm not really going to uh, expound on a whole lot more because a lot of my questions have already been answered, so thank you. Thank you. You touched on um, industries that are vulnerable. Um, I think transportation, it was probably mentioned a couple of times. So my question is, um, can you name some others that would be the most vulnerable to automation and artificial intelligence and why that would be? So I think we, you know, we, we, in my testimony, I talked about, um, you know, a couple of the industries that, that could be vulnerable. I mean, we talked a lot about industrial and manufacturing. Um, we do see, uh, you know, our, our food and beverage um, industry. Um, but I don't necessarily think it's, it's going to be AI. I think it's going to be just more uh, trying to um, reduce labor costs. Um, so, for example, uh, and these are mainly like fast you know, fast, fast casual uh, restaurants where you'll see if you've been, to, well, hopefully you're not eating at any of these fast food places, but if you've been there, um, you've seen the kiosks uh, now popping up instead of cashiers. Um, and, and, you know, our focus there is really, if you have individuals, um, you know, the machines need to be programmed. Um, you know, it certainly, we do not want to get into an era where the machines are programming each other because that is going to be bad for all of us. Uh, but that is where tech, uh, you know, technology comes in where, you know, there, the need f for those restaurants will change. Instead of uh, someone with cashier skills, they're going to need someone with IT skills. Um, so that's why it's important for us to focus on the workforce of tomorrow. 
Uh, so initiatives like Computer Science for All, uh, where we are talking about technology at a very young age, and we're trying to direct and make sure that the entire uh, workforce that's coming, uh, our next generation, uh, has some type of literacy in um, understanding technology uh, is a good strategy because those are some of the areas that we think um, it, the skill sets will change, uh, but the demand for employment will be consistent. Okay, thank you. I completely agree and um, appreciated your testimony specifically um, as it related to the partnerships. I think that it's really important that we continue to partner business and education, specifically college prep, Mm -hmm. STEM, mm -hmm. all of that, we need to talk more and we need to integrate more programs like this into um, the education system so that our youth are prepared. And it's really good to know that, you know, uh, something like this can be, you know, programmed now by a 10 year old. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I think we're on the right track. Yeah. I just think that we need to uh, continue to do more of what we're doing um, in the right way. So right. thank you very much. Thank you. And I just want to say that it's not, you know, we, we want to pr uh, partner with not only with academic institutions, but also uh, Department of Education, uh, because we know that not everyone continues on to college, uh, but we want to make sure that if college is not, you know, um, the next step for our high school students, that they have a skill that's in demand. Um, you know, that is personal for me uh, because I, you know, was a college dropout and I taught myself how to code. I wish all these resources was available when I was a 17-year-old, uh, but our goal is really how do you touch that 17-year-old that may not even know about our services and how do we do that uh, in an in a equitable manner to make sure that they have uh, the opportunity to take advantage of these resources. Uh, that's why partnerships is important um, and thank you very much for, for helping us with that. Thank you so much. We're going to see if we can pull you in more to some of our programming when it comes to churches and, and other places in Absolutely. the community as well to pull you into. Those are our best resources, yeah. by the yeah. way, yeah. Our, our churches, our mosques, our synagogues, huh? uh, because that's where you have the grandmother uh, or the aunt right. or the grandfather or, or the uncle that's going to know that young person that needs to hear about this program. Mm -hmm. So definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Adams. Um, <clears throat> Appropriate that, that along your lines that we were uh, attempting to uh, identify what the workforce, the potential workforce really is. One of the questions that we, we um, certainly it is super important that we educate our next generation workforce in, in an appropriate way, 22nd century jobs, and, and that we're not doing things that we were doing 50 years ago in terms of manufacturing, in terms of industry, recognizing what what industries really are, um, but there is a a, uh, a group of folk that of, of uh, low skilled workers that were traditionally low wage workers that we um, uh, addressed in 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 the council and, and the admin and whether it was uh, fifteen dollars an hour and mm -hmm. paid sick and the things that really improved their quality of life. But when we talk to small businesses, they say that it was. Uh, not necessarily the burden that they were prepared to take on. And so what we see in those is exactly what you said. We see in the fast food industry, we see uh, um, uh, kiosks and then car washes, we see animation and, and, and other, other industries that we can kind of go on and on. Um, then they become a target audience as well. And, and what are we prepared to do in, in terms of giving them the skills that they, they move on because there are certain industries that are going to transition or not going to survive as they're currently constituted and that workforce um, is no longer necessary. What is, what is the, the overall greater plan to not just to educate those, to, but to re-educate to be able to transition those who are moving out of one industry or into the next? So I think, you know, um, you're absolutely correct, and, and we need to do, and, and we need to focus on uh, ensuring that we connect um, that workforce to our training programs. Uh, most of our training programs uh, that I covered in, in all those sectors uh, have the assumption that you are not necessarily, uh, you're not in that, in that sector, uh, so you need to actually learn a little bit more. Um, so for example, 
uh, you know, industrial manufacturing, there is like a math and science component, but other than that, we assume you've never, you know, uh, programmed a CNC machine. Um, for our, in, a, in many of our tech programs, uh, there is some t sort of accountability to make sure that you understand what your, um, you know, what the, the job entails, but then everything else, it starts from the ground up uh, in terms of teaching you that skill. Um, so for us, it's more of can we um, find those workers who have the low skill um, and connect them to our training. Uh, we've made a huge investment in terms of dollars uh, to expand the amount of training programs that we have. Uh, as part of the mayor's uh, career pathways uh, report, um, which was at the beginning of this administration, uh, there was a commitment uh, to increase the number of training. Uh, so our strategy has always been and continue to be uh, that training is uh, the, the tool that we will use uh, to uh, allow individuals in low skill jobs uh, to get the skills that they need and level up in terms of the uh, wages earned. And we've seen wages increase. Uh, obviously we could do a lot more uh, and we continue to figure out, um, as Michaela me mentioned, uh, as the industry is changing, we want to make sure that we're not training people in sectors uh, or in skills uh, that will ultimately be, re you know, automation will ultimately replace. And, and as you said, that have, have we kind of identified uh, folks within the industry, these industries that may be being displaced, specifically the ones that we, we've just talked about or some of the ones that are upcoming? And if, if so, what does that look like currently? How are we working with these folks to upgrade their skills? In, in specifically, like how how does the training work for? Well, so so there there, there are obviously a, a number of things that could happen in, in terms of uh, universal benefits that that would ensure that workers that are displaced um, receive a, a plethora of, of benefits and resources um, outside of just training. How do we have have we identified them? And if so, what is what what is kind of some of those supportive services look like? So I think if if I understand the, the question correctly, so outside of training, uh, some of the things that we do see is sort of like a, a bridge programs. Um, literally, how do you if someone and that's that's why we were able to uh, that's why we design our training programs in a, with the apprenticeship model um, because it's not just you come you get trained and then you find a job. Uh, our, our apprenticeship program is our, the employers that are participating uh, upon acceptance, uh, it, they're actually an employee of that particular firm. And part of that reason is because we wanna make sure that as individuals are being trained, uh, they have an income. Uh, because that's very important for, for the low skill and probably low uh, income individuals who may have issues with, uh, for example, uh, just transportation, getting to and from the training. Uh, they may have issues with childcare. Um, and again, the time uh, to commit to actually do the training. Um, so bridge programs are essential and uh, you know, we have, uh, as part of our uh, model, have built in uh, um, um, surgically uh, in some of these programs, we have, for example, social workers who are working with the individuals to make sure that if there are any other outside challenges that will prevent them from being successful, uh, that they have the support that they need. Hopefully that's the, 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 the question that you you were asking yep that is that is precisely what we were okay. asking yeah, okay. <laughs> you know that that um that sometimes things aren't that black and white and they look it's a little more complicated and that these folks are uh, sometimes they find themselves in the, the lower wage industries for a particular reason that they did not have the supportive services and that that were necessary for for, for their upward mobility right um, and, I th and, and obviously we could do a lot more in that particular area and i know um, there are advocates who have pushed um, uh, for increased uh, funding in that area, and, and that is something that um, I understand um, because it is, it's important um, for individuals. Um, you know, what we have found is that uh, as long as you provide the, the, the resources to teach, uh, they will learn. Um, it's really the other things, life, that, that yeah. prevents them from, from being successful. So we need to do everything possible uh, to address, you know, uh, when life uh, issues uh, happen. Okay. Um, DCAS. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Do you believe that automation and, and, and other technologies will have a significant impact on the city's uh, municipal workforce? And, and what have we seen? Uh, sure, so good morning, um, Chair Miller and council members. Uh, committee members, sorry. Um, sure, we have seen um, that, of course, automation technology will have an impact on the workforce. However, uh, we believe that this impact is purely positive um, and it is not detrimental to the workforce um, to have automated processes and to bring in technology so that we can deliver services more efficiently, um, deliver more of our services um, so that we can better um, provide the different services that we provide to the city um, and the people of the city. I, you know, obviously my background is in, in, in transportation, obviously also as well as the municipal workforce, but I, I know that we've seen uh, certain technologies that allow for a, a, a better flow of traffic, uh, move buses and trains along signaling and other technologies. Are there industries, uh, other industries that we've seen um, administratively or otherwise that allow for us to provide a more efficient uh, service and, and are we training this and the next generation and particularly our civil servants to be a part of this technology as well and not necessarily uh, wake up one day and, and not be prepared and are kind of insourcing uh, or outsourcing work because of the need to do things more efficiently. Right, so uh, the, the city's workforce is very large, but uh, I believe that our, our workforce is very nimble um, and our workforce is able to adapt to technological advances as they come along and as they roll out. So of course, uh, in order to enable that happening, we have to make sure that we pair any sort of technology um, influx, we pair that with, um, through our partnership with our training partners, make sure that um, employees are given the uh, latest uh, courses in order to learn how to use that technology and also to partner with labor so that labor can also pool their resources um, in order to train their um, members. Are, are, are you seeing um, within our civil service uh, workforce any additional opportunities by virtue of new technology that, that is coming to being now, that uh, additional training, is, is there any um, conversation, negotiations going on with bargaining units that say that, hey, if we can provide this next level skill set that there's additional compensation. Um, conversely, uh, you're kind of out of a job if it doesn't happen. So uh, th there is, uh, I, it's been my experience that, that we've kind of had some of those conversations that uh, I know when and, uh, uh, the deputy commissioner and I was, and I, and I obviously we work well in, in doing that, identifying um, jobs of the future and making sure that the current workforce were, were, had an opportunity to be trained um, for those positions. Are we being proactive in that way? And, and if so, could you identify some of the uh, uh, ways that we are being proactive? Sure, so it's, it's actually one of the missions of DCAS to uh, provide the workforce of tomorrow to um, city agencies. So uh, what you're saying definitely goes along hand in hand with our mission and our objectives for um, providing this workforce. We've seen through our citywide learning and development, our training center, um, we've seen uh, an uptick in the uh, sorts of courses that folks are taking in order to enhance their skills. So we're seeing more data analytics, we're seeing uh, people taking Excel, we're seeing people um, are also taking our IT certification courses through our vendors. Um, but conversely, we're also seeing that people are building up their soft skills. So they're building up their customer service skills, they're taking project management, um, they're learning about supervisory skills. So, uh, the, you know, hand in hand, the workforce, yes, is um, we definitely see a trend towards learning these new uh, technological advanced skills, but also with a focus on that human service, uh, which is you know such a wonderful thing that the workforce of the city does provide to the people of the city. Um, you know, our focus is customer service and uh, deliver when we're delivering these services. So we definitely see that those two things are happening hand in hand. Well, you, you, we're not seeing, because clearly there are industries that are gonna be 100% automated. 
right? I don't know whether within the municipal workforce that we've seen that or identified that. There are, and, and there, are, there I, I don't believe that because most of the time the services that are, the, the municipal services that get delivered are, are kind of human customer service services and, and, and that's not necessarily replaceable, although um, when we get the crunch, uh, budget crunch, they're like, uh, get rid of, we, why do we need somebody reading or selling tokens or doing these things or that when we can kind of care ourselves or do it in a different way when we know overall that it has a much greater value than that. But at the same time, um, there are often many new positions that have been created over the years, right? And uh, if, if, if I look at um, the city's workforce and, and some of the positions that are antiquated that, that we kind of go back and forth about whether or not they should be kind of banded into something else, whether they should be disbanded. But at the same, same time, within the same agencies often, um, there are new positions that are created are we looking at those uh, positions um, that may be considered antiquated and looking at the workforce and saying, hey, if you upgrade your skills, here's a position for you, or we just kind of do attrition, and like, eh, we're gonna ride this out, be less efficient, and, and find somewhere, the workforce that we need somewhere else. Is, is that the most efficient way to do it, or are we working collaboratively with labor, with organized labor, to say, hey, that, you know, we could be better here. There's a reason why 65 million folks um, come to New York to visit. There's a reason why uh, uh, multinational corporations want to set up business here. It is because of the critical services that our municipal workforce and others provide. How do we maintain that, but also grow it, that we're, provide, we're, we're being more efficient at the same time, protecting the integrity of, of those jobs? I think that requires real conversation that often, you know, we on the labor side may pound our fist that we don't do that. But at the same time, there's a stark reality that we must face in terms of IT technology and automation. Are we having that conversation? What are we doing to have that conversation? Are there specific areas that we're looking toward? Yeah, so on a, on a, on a regular basis, um, DCAS works with our city agency partners and with our labor partners uh, to, to discuss just that, to discuss what's happening with the workforce, to discuss specific job titles um, where we're introducing um, technology or uh, where we think we can do things more efficiently and how we can uh, evolve that job um, with the workforce that's currently doing that job um, and take them along with us. Uh, so that is something that we do on a regular basis. Um, you know, I'm very happy to say that we have robust partnerships with labor um, and with our city agencies, and that helps to speak to what offerings we provide at our um, training center, but also what offerings um, our labor partners provide um, on their end. Uh, so I, I will speak to um, that, yes, we are seeing that um, technology is sort of shifting some of the work and I gave some examples of how we're moving towards more customer service, more in-person, providing um, you know, quicker responses, that sort of thing. Um, but we are not seeing that uh, work is, be, you know, maybe some tasks are becoming antiquated, um, but we're not seeing jobs or um, you know, in, uh, workforce areas where uh, people are being uh, replaced or are seen as antiquated. And uh, the, the reason why I know this is because um, we're not seeing that we are deleting city titles. We have well over 2,000 um, titles that perform work for the city, and we're not seeing that uh, the workforce is shrinking or that we are doing away with some of these titles. It's, it's just simply not happening. Um, but we, what we are seeing is that as the job evolves and as some tasks sort of move away towards automation, um, we do see that the jobs become uh, different and that the employees um, use their current skill set in order to bolster uh, these um, new skills. So they're able to be nimble and to move forward. So, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with most of what you said, but I know that there's another reality and that reality is that often, you know, I, I've seen titles a trip down to five people, three people, and, and, and that would not be consistent with, with, with what you're saying. 
and instead of really um, bolstering from within and training from within to make sure that there's it, nothing wrong with, you know, a title is, is, is merely a name if you want to get rid of it and call it something else, as long as the same people, the same bargaining unit continues to do the work and, and are compensated accordingly, then, then that's not a problem. But to, you know, I don't think that because the title continues to exist, does, it does not remain relevant or does not mean that the city roles have not been diminished because it could have been 250 people in the title that is now six, but it still exists. And I, and I know we've kind of gone back and forth whether or not that makes sense or not. Um, so, you know, that's, that, that is a, a different reality as well as um, what we've seen is, is uh, uh, a lot of outsourcing of, of, of things, of technology in particular, that, that has been done historically um, by bargaining units such as uh, 375 and others. And, and I know that there was some insourcing agreements, how, how tangible and how successful have they been and, and, and what do you have for the future in terms of it being able to expand those? Uh, so that's actually uh, leading to a perfect example of um, our labor city agency and DCAS partnerships. So uh, you're correct, the city uh, was utilizing some of these contracts uh, to, in order to um, work on certain uh, technology projects. Uh, and then in a parallel track, what we've done together is um, really looked at the workforce, see who do we need? Who do we need on a regular basis and what skill set do they need to bring to the table or how can we train up our current um, employees so that they can fulfill these roles? And what we've done is we've sort of altered the way that the title structure looks um, for the IT titles, meaning we've gone to the State Civil Service Commission, we've said, hey, we need some more um, titles that have specified skills, um, and each agency needs X number of them, and uh, we've been very successful in that regard. So we, we are seeing that the city is um, sort of shifting and maneuvering around these different technological skills, but on the other hand, um, you know, we continuously um, host citywide hiring pools for technology-based titles. Uh, we actually have one coming up, um, I believe in January, for uh, a computer manager title, computer systems, computer systems manager. So we do see that agencies are, um, through civil service, still continually hiring these employees, either, and these are employees that currently work for them and they're promoting them up through the ranks, or they are um, you know, reaching out and uh, hiring new talent. So we're seeing both. And, and how do we currently train the workforce for emerging technology? We talked about transportation and so forth, and, and, and are, are we actually training uh, forward our, our workforce, or are we just taking longer warranties on, on equipment? And, and, and so that they, um, so that our current workforce has the ability to, to uh, maintain the equipment that they had been historically maintaining, but now they're a little more technologically advanced, and, and so how does that happen? As well as have we, you talked about logistics, warehousing, and so forth in, on the private sector side. Obviously, you know, from, from a DCAS perspective, we have tons of this that, that happens throughout the city. Um, is there any um, technological advances, automation that is happening um, in, 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 in industry-wide in, in for, for the city? So does D in DCAS's warehouses and, and agencies' warehouses, um, are we utilizing some of the technology and the automation that we're seeing on the private sector side? If so, are we training the current workforce to make sure that they have an opportunity for some upward mobility there as well? Uh, so what we, and, and I'm not really uh, one to speak about what they're doing in the warehouses specifically, but um, I am aware of new technological systems that we have developed um, in-house uh, with our technology employees um, in order to either better track supplies, uh, keep tabs on who's requesting, um, look at trends uh, over, over several years so that we know what we need, what we don't need, how many employees we need during emergencies, how many employees we need during bad weather. Um, so we are utilizing um, that sort of technology in order to um, assist those employees that are still continually doing that work. Again, there's that, um, that people factor that hasn't changed. Um, and as you're aware, the, the size of the city's workforce has remained stable over the past 
um, at least five years. Um, and if anything, we've seen a slight uptick in the number of employees that we are hiring. And I think that speaks to um, the agencies and the city's commitment overall to our employees and to retention and um, you know, keep it in how important that knowledge base is to providing services for the city. Great. Um, no, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, Commissioner. I look forward to uh, working with you on some of these issues uh, in the very near future. Obviously, I think that we have identified some soft spots that that we can work together on mm -hmm. as well. That this is, you know, I, I'm I'm still a little disturbed that some of your colleagues weren't here because some of this stuff uh, with technology enforcement of some of the uh, labor regulations that we have recently put into uh, play um, changes a little bit, things happen, and we want to make sure that we have our finger on the pulse of all that stuff as well, that we're working collaboratively to uh, ensure that some of the things that we've worked on over the past five, six years um, to improve the quality of life for our workforce continues to happen and that it is not circumvented by, by technology and, 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 and we've already seen some of the unintended consequences of trying to do the right thing and industries backing up and saying, hey, I can't afford it, I'm gonna go with a kiosk, I'm gonna go with automation. And so we have to continue to talk about that so that we stay ahead of the curve in doing so. And in particular with the, um, with the uh, uh, municipal workforce as well, um, I'm excited about opportunity. I'm excited about the opportunity for workers to work uh, smarter and not harder, mm -hmm. right? And, and this technology will do so. We should be able to keep them safe, uh, keep them healthy, and, and, and be able to access and take advantage of all of the negotiations that, that have taken place over the years so that people walk away and they walk away healthy. And some of the jobs that we're talking about, um, some, some, some of the, uh, the people that are working in storerooms and, and uh, providing uh, equipment and tools and the rest of that stuff is, is, is still very labor intensive. Um, if there is a way f to see, to, to help those folks out, we wanna make sure that we're doing that, right? And, uh, but, at, but at the same time, that we're training them up, that they stay there and that they get to take advantage, that, that they've worked all the years and, and really put in the grunt work and now that they get an opportunity to work smarter, you know, they're, they're gonna be transitioned out. So um, I'd love to be able to continue this conversation. Look forward to conference, next week's conference. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited about that and, and we can continue some of this conversation. I wanna thank you both for, for joining us today. Thanks, very important. thanks for having us. Thank you. panel, Stephen Nunez, Zachary Perlin, and Eli Drofkin. Yeah, you're gonna close your eyes. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm kinda.
Okay, excited to hear from you all. So um, when you get a chance, please just start either way. Uh, just identify yourself, push the red button, and we'll look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Miller. My name is uh, Eli Dvorkin, and I'm the Editorial and Policy Director of the Center for an Urban Future. Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, CUF is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank focused on expanding economic opportunity, reducing inequality, and building stronger pathways to the middle class. And there's perhaps no issue more central to that mission in the years ahead or in need of greater attention than the impact of a more automated economy on New York City's workforce. Over the past two years, my colleagues and I at the center have produced the first research to analyze the potential effects of automation here in New York City. The good news is that the city is less vulnerable than much of the country. While about half of all job tasks nationwide could be automated, our research finds the same is true for just 39% of job tasks performed in New York. This resiliency is due to a large number of jobs that require one of three human-centric qualities, a high level of interpersonal skills, a high level of creativity, and or a high level of judgment. This includes the city's 147,000 home health aides whose jobs are just 11% automatable, the 59,000 designers and marketers in the city's fast-growing advertising industry whose jobs are just 13% automatable, and the 69,000 accountants and auditors whose jobs are just 12% automatable. But more than 456,000 jobs in the five boroughs are highly vulnerable to automation, and the pace of change will be particularly swift and destabilizing for many of the city's lower and middle income workers, including tens of thousands of bookkeepers, stock clerks, fast food workers, and cashiers. More than half of all of New York's most automatable occupations pay less than $40,000 per year, and most of those jobs are currently accessible to workers without a post-secondary degree. Left unchecked, these trends could further widen New York's opportunity divide. But New York City can get ahead of these powerful economic forces by launching the nation's first automation preparation plan. This plan will require an unprecedented new commitment to helping those most at risk in automating economy, New Yorkers already in the workforce. The City Council can start by helping to expand the, the city's upskilling infrastructure. This begins with new investments and city-funded training options for incumbent workers. Although New York benefits from an array of good workforce training programs focused on preparing New Yorkers for jobs, there are few re resources and relatively few options designed to help current workers navigate a changing occupation and industry. It should also include a major new investment to scale up the city's most effective tech training programs. New York is home to several organizations that have proven highly effective at moving New Yorkers with limited experience into tech sector roles. But these in-depth career-oriented programs generally serve from a few dozen to at most a few hundred people per year. To better prepare for an automated economy, these programs will need new resources to grow. The, city should, the council should also launch new efforts to make college credentials accessible and more affordable for working New Yorkers. This should include support for CUNY's efforts to help more of the 830,000 New Yorkers with some college but no degree to return and graduate, including by expanding support for the non-tuition costs, like housing and transportation and childcare, that prevent too many New Yorkers from graduating in the first place. The city could also follow California's lead and create an all-online community college in partnership with CUNY. California's newest community college, Calbright, is designed from inception to help working adults buttress their skills by earning short-term credentials and badges aligned with specific industry needs. The second big step should be to create lifelong learning accounts for New York City. Affording to earn a new credential or learn a new skill when you need it most, like right after losing employment, is a major barrier to upskilling. Establishing city-sponsored lifetime training accounts could help make those transitions easier by encouraging workers to save for future training. Modeled on several successful pilot programs that have operated across the country since 2001, these portable accounts could be employer matched, like retirement plans, allow workers to save pre-tax dollars, and travel with workers, including workers in the gig economy, from job to job. For low-income workers who lose a job due to automation, these accounts could also be seeded with public dollars in the form of a flexible skills building grant. We commend the City Council for taking seriously this growing challenge, and we urge New York City to lead the nation in preparing working people for a more automated economy. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Steven Nunez, and I am the project lead for the Guaranteed Income Initiative at the Jane Family Institute. Uh, we're an applied research organization here in the city. Uh, thank you for having me. 
So uh, JFI's largest research initiative is in guaranteed income policy. So this is a class of programs that provide unconditional cash assistance to combat poverty and to promote individual well-being. Uh, this includes universal basic income, but it's not limited to that. Uh, JFI is undertaking research on one of the largest guaranteed income policies in the world at the moment uh, in Marica, Brazil. Uh, and we also have a robust background in guaranteed income research uh, and uh, pilots across the country, including in Stockton, California, uh, Chicago, Illinois, and Newark, New Jersey. So there's a, a view that's prevalent uh, among proponents of universal basic income that technological change in the form of automation and artificial intelligence represents a, a distinct threat to the well-being of working and middle-class uh, households, and that we are close to undergoing something like an automation apocalypse. Um, now, JFI does not subscribe to this dire forecast, and it doesn't seem from your um, hearing testimony that anybody else here does either, which is good. Um, it's really not supported well by the data. Um, we instead view automation and artificial intelligence as the latest incarnation of ever-present technological change. Um, and like technological change from the past, uh, there is reason to believe that artificial intelligence and automation are going to be disruptive uh, to some sectors of the economy and to particular uh, jobs and job categories. Uh, but it's important to note that we don't attach uh, special significance to these effects um, because there are in fact many sources of disruption, uh, wage stagnation, and job displacement in the US economy today. And this includes the effects of trade, globalization, deregulation, uh, the weakening of uh, labor laws around the country, and the conditioning of the social safety net uh, on work. Um, and indeed, many of these forces are, in our minds, more impactful than technological change when it comes to job losses, wages, and poverty. Now, some of these economic transformations are outside of our control, uh, but many are the direct result of choices that lawmakers have made at the federal, state, and local uh, level over this last several decades. So while it's important and prudent to understand the effects of automation um, and uh, what the effects have been uh, in the past and will be in the future, uh, it's crucial that this attention to automation doesn't distract from other uh, potentially more consequential causes of precarity and poverty, nor from the actions that lawmakers can take to address that precarity and poverty in the present. New York City, um, differs from many other municipalities in that it already has a very strong minimum wage law um, and that it in fact has an EITC um, component to add to federal and state uh, EITC. We'd love to see that um, improved. Um, as the administration testified earlier, there's um, a lot of promise to be seen in apprenticeship programs, um, in sectoral employment programs uh, that couple job training with local labor market analysis and job placement through partnership with um, uh, employers. Um, and programs like Year Up, uh, which provide uh, stipends and training to young, uh, uh, to young workers. Uh, but at the same time, there's reason to believe that these sorts of programs cannot be uh, scaled greatly without beginning to displace other workers. And this is why JFI um, supports very strongly efforts to increase cash assistance uh, through the safety net um, at the federal, state, and local level. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Miller. Thank you for the invitation to share research findings today related to automation and labor market change. My name is Zach Perlin. I am a researcher at the Center on Poverty and Social Policy at Columbia University. And over the last couple of years, I've published on topics related to automation, labor market change, and in particular, the role of organized labor in shaping the social consequences of technological change. So I would just like to emphasize a couple broad takeaways from recent research on this subject. And I want to start with some of the employment effects of technological change. As others have said this morning already, uh, despite headline-grabbing reports that suggest that large shares of jobs are at risk of being automated in the future, there is not much reliable research that suggests that we are on the verge of any sort of mass technological unemployment. Technological innovation tends to create as many jobs as it destroys. The challenge, though, is that the jobs that are destroyed, that are created, sorry, tend to require different skills than the jobs that are lost. Specifically, the well-paying jobs created as a result of technological change are more likely to require a college degree or equivalent training. 
So even if we are not on the verge of high or rising levels of automation-induced unemployment, the consequences of this labor market change are, as you know, very real for the affected workers. The sales clerks and the machine operators who are laid off when their jobs are made redundant face real pain and real challenges. And this is where the services and support that the city provide are particularly important. Specifically, the evidence points to four core components in ensuring a smoother transition from the labor market of today to the one that awaits in the years ahead. The first is greater worker power. The research uh, for myself and others have demonstrated that unionized workers in these routine occupations, these occupations at more risk of automation, tend to experience more favorable earnings growth, a lower likelihood of working poverty, and longer employment tenures relative to non-unionized workers in similar occupations. Worker power does not have to come through union membership, uh, that's one avenue, but labor market regulations that the city implements and enforces can likewise ensure that workers maintain some power and some voice in the face of technological change. Second is income support programs. Adequate income support for displaced workers is fundamental towards ensuring their well-being and ensuring a smoother transition to their next employment opportunity and cash assistance in particular. Third, job training, access to education, and workforce, workforce development programs, as we've talked about already, are of course important components in preparing workers for a changing labor market, but I would like to emphasize that retraining alone is not an adequate solution to labor market change. It must go hand in hand with these income support programs to ensure the basic livelihood of displaced workers while they prepare for their next jobs. And finally, regulations to ensure that lower pay service sector jobs are still decent jobs. Many of the workers who are displaced from these routine occupations uh, who might otherwise pursue a routine job will end up in these service sector occupations instead. Service sector jobs tend to pay less than these industrial jobs of old um, that are being displaced. So the challenge in mitigating the effects of technological change then is to ensure that service sector work is still decent work. The city's recent minimum wage increase is one important step in that direction, as are policies that focus on scheduling regulations and employment standards for workers in precarious platform-based jobs. So to summarize, automation and technological change have a real effect on the labor market, but that effect is not mass unemployment. Instead, it's primarily the changing composition of jobs in the labor market and the skills necessary to obtain those jobs. So it's my opinion that if the city is to adequately serve its residents in the context of a changing labor market, it should focus on those four components I mentioned. Enhancing worker power, providing adequate income support for jobless adults, ensuring access to education and job training, and ensuring that lower pay service sector jobs are still decent jobs. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I, I, I do have a, a, a couple of brief, very brief questions and, and, and um, Mr. Powell, and while, while you're there and you talked about worker power and, and something that I've experienced myself as a past president and business agent um, representing workers and kind of knowing that you are, are, are responsible for, for being able to uh, not necessarily predict but to foresee these changing trends in technology and other trends that may happen and being able to, to be able to negotiate uh, on, uh, on behalf of the, your workforce that they will be del continue to deliver those services and that they will be trained with the skills that are necessary as well. And that obviously um, has everything to do with collective bargaining and, and having that voice and while we would love to see it um, happen uh, throughout the cities, uh, whether it's public, private, union, or non-union, oftentimes it's not going to happen, and 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 oftentimes also outside of the purview of this body here to to make it happen. But we would love to lead by example and saying that this is how we treat workers here. But uh, often I, I believe that it is incumbent on those uh, representing those those workers that, that they they have the vision and foresight. Uh, to work with the other side of the table to, to make sure that the jobs are being preserved but that the services are being provided by that workforce, that they're developing the skills. And, and oftentimes that come by virtue of collective bargaining and whether or not terms and conditions are, are, are altered of work are, are being altered and that they are in control of that. So that is super important in doing so. Um, conversely, 
oftentimes in the industries that we're seeing that are being impacted are not those that are, are, are represented. Um, and, and it was mentioned, uh, I think by all three, that it was, that this is something that has to be addressed holistically and that uh, one of the things that was mentioned was the, uh, was the uh, support programs and the income support and the other kind of wraparound services that go along with that. Are there any specific examples that we can speak to um, nationally or internationally that uh, we, we may find ourselves taking advantage of here in the near future in New York? Yes, sir. I, uh, honestly, I think the largest challenge is that there's not enough good examples. So if you think of uh, the uh, worker who's displaced from his or her occupation today, um, if they qualify for unemployment insurance, great, that's one important step, but many do not. And what's left for the workers who become jobless, who do not qualify for UI or if their unemployment insurance runs out? In most places, it's food stamp benefits, uh, benefits from the SNAP program. And depending on the size of your family or if you have kids or not, uh, those food stamps might not go very far. In fact, if you don't have kids at all and you are an able-bodied adult, it's usually uh, three months out of three years that you're eligible to receive these benefits. Of course, food stamps don't buy diapers. They don't buy the Metro card. Uh, it's pretty restricted to food. Uh, TANF, uh, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, is the other program that's currently on the books, uh, particularly targeted at low-income families with children. Um, but we've seen uh, in New York and throughout the country over the last uh, decade or two that cash benefits from TANF have dwindled dramatically. And so unfortunately, there just aren't many strong income support programs in place at the moment, especially for workers who, for one reason or another, do not qualify for unemployment insurance. And, and Mr. Nunez, w w in your mind, what would those, what, what would a program such as that look like? Well, if we're, if we're taking baby steps, um, there's, a lot of work right now um, in terms of um, building support uh, that's provided through the EITC, making it stronger, making sure that households that do not have dependent children also receive uh, a fair amount of aid. Um, there's also uh, research going on about um, whether or not uh, EITC could be turned into a program that um, is dispersed more regularly, perhaps on a monthly basis, rather than at the end of the year in a lump sum so that people can use it regularly. But in the end, that's still, um, that's still cash that's gated behind employment, um, which means um, that folks who cannot work, uh, folks who are working but are in the sort of the gray economy um, are not receiving it. And it also means that um, when a recession comes around, um, when that sort of aid is most necessary for people, it, it's not available because, uh, because they cannot get a job. Um, so we'd love to see um, something more like um, a negative income tax where uh, work is not um, necessary before you restart to receive some aid. Um, a good example of a program that's sort of um, exploring that space is uh, U.S. Congresswoman uh, Rashida Tlaib has the Boost Act, um, which is trying is a way of transforming the EITC into a program that gets aid into people's hands. Um, although it is not ideal because it doesn't provide uh, for families without children, um, there are a lot of people also working on a universal child allowance uh, under the idea that gating aid uh, for children behind work is. is not only unconscionable, but actually um, counterproductive because we know very well the effects of poverty on children. Um, and we know that um, allowing children to, to grow up in poverty leads to larger problems down the line in terms of education, in terms of poverty, in terms of the criminal justice system. So many people also see that as an investment to get hands into the, the uh, get aid into the hands of those families. And then, and then finally, uh, Eli, for you, what, industries have you seen to be the most or least vulnerable in terms of automation? Thank you, Chair, yes. Um, we've seen a few industries uh, at the very top end, and particularly when we look at 
both what's most vulnerable but also where most New Yorkers work. Um, so in terms of the specific occupations that are most vulnerable, it's still those frontline production occupations, sewing machine operators, uh, you know, meat cutters. Um, th these are the jobs that were vulnerable to automation 20 years ago, they still are today, but they're still relatively small uh, numbers of jobs overall. And frankly, our economy shed so many of those jobs already. I mean, we had over a million manufacturing jobs in New York you know, 70 years ago, and today we're down to 70,000. So it's an order of magnitude smaller than it once was. I think where I'm kind of most concerned are the jobs that are particularly large sources of employment today, but are, um, are particularly vulnerable to automation. So there I would point to bookkeeping clerks, which is a large occupation class in New York City. This is not b accountants. This is people that are supporting those types of roles. And Excel is a version of automating that work, and not to mention all of the other products that have come around since that make it almost impossible, make it almost uh, obviate the, the human input there. And that's, you know, 70,000 jobs in New York City today. Um, food prep and service is the other one that I'd be most concerned about, because we see it already, you know, at the Wendy's and the McDonald's with the, the automation, um, you know, right there as the point of sale. Um, but that is, the, the, the incentives are there structurally in a big way to make that shift. Um, and, you know, as much as people are, we're still going to have waiters in, you know, fine dining restaurants because people want that experience. But when the priority is quick and cheap, you're going to see the, the incentives there. And frankly, only more so with the $15 minimum wage, which, you know, absolutely helps lift New Yorkers out of poverty, but does have real consequences when it comes to the incentives that are driving bigger changes in the economy. Um, you know, uh, the other uh, area that I would point to would certainly be uh, different in this time around from maybe the last time, and that's the other larger group of the sort of back office operations. I mean, if there's one thing that really stood out to me, it was that automation has really moved off of the factory floor and into the, into the office building. Um, and there's a lot of workers there that are vulnerable, but I would agree with my colleagues here, not that I think those jobs are going to disappear in a puff of smoke, but that the Te the level of technical fluency and digital skills and other competencies required to maintain, to be competitive in that, in those jobs is increasing already dramatically. And it's not to say that those jobs are going to disappear, but the folks that are able to access them, those pathways are gonna get steeper and longer. And folks without a post-secondary credential uh, who have not graduated high school are gonna find that both the first rung of employment and certainly these opportunities for economic mobility are getting further out of reach. And so to me, I just wanted to sort of reemphasize, I think the core point here from my perspective, absolutely, I think what, what uh, my colleagues here have mentioned, uh, strategies that really focus on lifting folks out of poverty. Um, there's no doubt that the research supports the power of you know, direct cash transfers to do so. But I think what I'm interested in here is to say that I think the unique challenge that automation poses is really around incumbent workers. We have lots of issues in New York when it we still have 17% you know, of New Yorkers in poverty today. We still have major issues when it comes to just barriers to employment in the first place, particularly for folks that are formerly incarcerated or you know, who have lower levels of formal educational attainment or limited English proficiency, absolutely. But what really concerns me about this automation question, I think the, what, should, what this should prompt is really examining what do we have in place today that builds the skills of our incumbent workforce? and then supports them in gaining those skills. And that's where I think this income support piece is so critical. And so just to quickly touch on the last question, you know, thinking about what do we have in New York City? I mean, on the federal level, we're talking about big structural changes that would make a huge difference for New York. But what can the city council do? I mean, I would point to programs like CUNY ASAP, which has been tremendously effective at boosting community college graduation rates. And the, the council and the mayor together have expanded ASAP to, I think, 25,000 more you know, students in total. But there's no reason why, based on the data that we have, that every Every community college shouldn't be an ASAP college. Every, you know, we then are piloting a version of that for senior colleges, I believe, at John Jay. But the evidence will support that this is absolutely dramatically boosting college graduation rates. At the same time, if you're an incumbent worker today and you want, you're, you may think that going back to college, you, everybody could tell you this is the best way to get a good job. But you've got, you know, two kids, you've already got a job, you've got all of these demands on your time, maybe you've just lost that job, you know, you're taking care of an older family member. For all of these reasons and more, going back to college full time is never going to be an accessible option. And yet, when you go to something like a CUNY continuing education program, there is no tap for that. There is no tuition assistance for that, let alone support for childcare or transportation or any of these other needs. So I would say that at the core of this is, re is building out our skills acquisition infrastructure, but then coupling that with supports for some of these non-tuition financial barriers to make that kind of learning across a lifetime accessible for more New Yorkers. Thank you, thank you to the panel. Thank you very much. We're gonna call our, our next panel. And just on that note, I, I, I recall, and I forgot to ask the admin when they were up there, I think it was EDC, 
talked about their technology boot camp and, and the training, and then they failed to mention that it was a $2,000 deposit associated with that, which makes it pretty much impossible for the majority of the people that would be interested in that program, right? So we, we're talking about access here. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Final panel, Jesse Lehman and Josh Kellerman. And Zachary Hack. Okay, you can start at either end. Please just uh, state your name, push the red button. And let's go. What do we have? Could you just give me one second? I want to. Make sure I have the testimony in my hand before we get started. Good morning, or afternoon at this point. Um, uh, thank you, council member, uh, for this hearing and uh, again uh, for this committee which consistently addresses important issues. It's not, not the first time that we've come before you. Uh, my name is Jesse Lehman. I'm the director of policy and advocacy at the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. We're the umbrella organization that represents all the groups in New York that provide job training, uh, job placement services, and career advancement uh, as well as sort of helping fill educational gaps that job seekers have. Um, and uh, we, what we wanted to talk about today, and I think it's been addressed well by some of the, the testimony you've heard before, uh, as well as from, including from our, our friends and allies at the Center for an Urban Future, uh, is the degree to which technology and automation uh, will inevitably cause disruption in the workplace, but that disruption will not be felt equally by all workers. Uh, it will fall the hardest on lower income workers, and, and I wanna draw attention in particular to workers with lower levels of educational attainment. Uh, as Eli from Center for an Urban Future was, was drawing out, uh, there is, should be less concern about the notion of jobs disappearing in a puff of smoke, and more concerned about the notion that workers will be expected to have a higher level of technical fluency and ability to deal with a changing workplace, and that will put greater pressure on their underlying skill levels and educational levels. Uh, and, and that's a real concern and a real problem for us at the Employment and Training Coalition because we are already seeing that the clients that are coming to our providers uh, seeking help finding new jobs and new careers are more and more uh, facing uh, barriers due to their lower levels of educational attainment. Um, new York's economy is strong. Many, many people have jobs. Unemployment is at a historic low level. And that means that the people who remain unemployed are primarily people that either don't have a high school degree or are lacking a math or a uh, language skill. Perhaps they don't speak English, but they actually have good education otherwise. Um, they're foreign born. Um, and more and more, we're seeing advanced training programs, including in high technology jobs, are unable to fill the slots that they have to train people be unless they have a partnering bridge program that can prepare clients uh, in the math or literacy skills that they need to be able to even start and succeed in those programs. Uh, and so there is a, a great need for bridge programs. I was uh, happy to hear you bring this up in an exchange with Commissioner Bishop, and thank you for that. Um, but I do want to call out that the administration has known for some time that there is a need to increase the investment in bridge programs. Uh, their overall workforce development blueprint for the city is called Career Pathways. That's a report that's almost five years old now. And that report called for spending $60 million a year on bridge programs to address this particular need. Uh, we are almost at the five-year mark of that plan when they said their promises would be 
uh, implemented, and they are only funding one third as much as they promised, just over $20 million of bridge programs citywide across several agencies. Um, that is an unacceptable shortfall, and that is, from our perspective, the single biggest budgetary problem in workforce development from a city perspective, the underfunding of bridge programs in particular. New York is lucky in that we have a great variety of advanced training programs in fields from construction to technology to healthcare. But if those programs can't find enough clients that have the 10th grade or the high school equivalency levels of math or reading to even begin the programs and succeed, then their stellar results at placing people into jobs won't be helping this vast number of New Yorkers who are shut out uh, of the booming economy. So we need to make good on the promise to invest in bridge programs. Uh, and we need to remember that all of the challenges that we see in the workplace, including automation, affect people in unequal ways, and they are going to fall the hardest on people who have lower levels of educational attainment and who are working in lower wage jobs. And so we need to make sure that our investments from the public side are counteracting that and are focused mostly on the people who need them the most. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for calling this hearing. Um, it's uh, been quite enlightening. Um, my name is Zachary Hecht, and I'm the policy director for Tech NYC. We're a nonprofit coalition with the mission of supporting the technology industry in New York through increased engagement between our <clears throat> more than 750 member companies, the New York government, and the community at large. Tech NYC works to foster a dynamic, diverse, and creative ecosystem, ensuring that New York is the best place to start and grow a technology company and that New Yorkers benefit from the resulting innovation. Uh, a number of our member companies have been making advancements in the fields of artificial intelligence and robotics. Um, as you've heard, these advancements will undoubtedly help increase efficiency and accuracy in a range of settings, leading to improved outcomes and reduced costs across industries from healthcare to finance to retail uh, and for a range of stakeholders, including customers. However, the purpose of today's hearing is not to discuss the many benefits of automation, but to discuss how automation will affect our city's workforce. And this is an extremely important conversation, and while studies demonstrate that New York City's workforce is less vulnerable to automation than the rest of the country, there will still be a very real impact for a number of New York workers. Um, as you've heard, recent studies do demonstrate that only a small proportion of jobs in New York City are likely to actually be fully eliminated while many are likely to be augmented, altered, or partially automated. And in all of these cases, we must recognize that along with technological change comes new opportunities for workers, and this will undoubtedly be the case with automation. In order to ensure workers whose roles have changed or been eliminated are able to take advantage of these new opportunities, it is vital to ensure technology training and education are accessible to more and more workers of all backgrounds. It will also be important to ensure that our city's students are receiving an education that prepares them for the modern workforce and positions them to take advantage of many of these new technologies. Now, in considering how to best move forward, we do need to recognize that New York City is already undertaking steps to make sure our students and workforce can thrive in the 21st century. We heard uh, a lot of that in other testimony today. Public officials and private enterprise in New York have come together to create a city that's training its residents to succeed. From the hugely important initiatives like CS for All, CUNY Cornell Tech Whitney program, to EDC's efforts to support the development of workforce training programs for 21st century jobs. New York State has also recently passed legislation that creates a commission to study the impacts of artificial intelligence and robotics and includes how these things impact the workforce. All of these efforts make it clear that New York City and state are committed to understanding the future of work and ensuring that our workforce is prepared to stay competitive. Yet, we can and should do more to equip New Yorkers with skills and position them for success. This includes expanding already existing programs, programmatically and geographically, as well as exploring new policies to encourage upskilling and continuing education. You've heard a lot of very good suggestions today. Uh, we echo uh, some of the sentiment that you just heard on bridge programs. Um, we also echo the testimony by Cuff to establish lifelong learning training accounts, and we could fund that through workers, business, and government, and that would help workers pay for training and ongoing education. And our state and city also should examine how to better leverage worker training tax credits and new forms of educational funding like income share agreements, and I think that's something the city's looking at right now. 
Um, and new technologies can often be daunting and they do pose real challenges, yet we shouldn't let these challenges impede responsible innovation and advancement. In order to make sure that all New Yorkers are benefiting from innovation and technological advances, it is incumbent upon government, business, and the public to work together to de demystify and understand technology, to plan for the future, and to put forward real solutions. Uh, and we look forward to being a part of these conversations. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Josh Kellerman. I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Re Retail, Wholesale, and Department Store Union. Apologies, I don't have uh, written testimony, although I submitted electronically following this, uh, this uh, meeting. Um, I'm going to speak about this sort of two main things. One is how technology and the future of work is likely to impact the industries that my union is active in. Um, and then also speak to some of the solutions that we see going forward, which will mirror many that have been uh, referenced today. Um, so first, uh, you know, the Retail Workers Union, RWDSU, represents workers in several sectors that are highly subject to automation, uh, apparel retail, food retail, uh, these include department stores, groceries, cafeterias, as well as distribution centers. Um, and so from everything from self-checkout, which is already implemented across many stores, um, but you know, essentially what this is doing is just making c customers do the work. <laughs> and then uh, you know, we're losing uh, employment in the process, uh, and so obviously this is a more efficient stance for companies, but uh, it's borne uh, essentially solely by workers and consumers. Um, the automation of food preparation is uh, happening across, th across the, um, the industry. Um, there's robotic stock checkers now within stores. Uh, I don't know if you've been in a stop and shop recently, but there's this uh, uh, sort of cylindrical uh, gray uh, machine that kind of wanders around and it, right now it's just identifying um, hazardous uh, things within the store and it stops at that and says hazard, hazard um, on aisle three. That's the first step to moving towards uh, actual automatic stock checking. Um, and then uh, online retail, of course, is, is a significant form of automation. Um, and what we're seeing in brick and mortar stores is they're turning into what we call click and mortar stores. So the front end is still a traditional brick and mortar, but the back end is now a distribution center. And uh, workers, uh, for example, at our Bloomingdale store, who some of whom are um, commissioned workers, we're being actively pulled off of commission sales to stock online orders. And so we're working to deal with some of these issues uh, through our contracts, but at stores that aren't union, obviously it's just sort of a top-down approach to, um, to how that works. Um, robotics in warehouses, um, we're seeing actually in some ways more dangerous conditions in warehouses. Um, as aut robots take over significant portions of, of the job, it means that workers are subject to faster and faster work routines to sort of catch up with the robots. And there is essentially no way to lift and twist a box for 12 hours a day without being injured. Um, and the last thing I'll mention that hasn't been mentioned today around automation um, and its impact on workers is privacy in the workplace. Um, it's sort of the other side of automation that um, uh, and is, is about the future of work where workers are more and more under surveillance while they're on the job. Um, and, and so, for example, what Amazon has done uh, currently in, in, in its uh, warehouses is workers have handheld um, computers essentially that direct them to the next fulfillment order, um, uh, but it also tracks every single movement that the worker makes um, and times everything that the worker does. There are countdown clocks and as workers meet um, certain, uh, certain thresholds uh, for how quickly they're able to do a job, it, the algorithm will sort of ratchet it down to a faster timeline and to this point where there's a sort of constant level of fear and tension within the workplace and a worker's ability to meet these, uh, these uh, untenable demands over a 10 or 12 hour workday. Um, and of course, uh, these metrics and this surveillance will only become more and more prevalent. So Amazon has put in a patent for a wristwatch that um, actually notices the specific movements of the hand and will vibrate to move the hand to different directions uh, to, find, to locate items. And so there's only another step to then having a, a piece on that that will uh, identify your, um, your heart rate. And then the, that heart rate information could then be used potentially for employment decisions. We now know that um, workers have been fired by robots at Amazon. If you don't actually meet um, your certain time threshold three times within a certain period of time, then you receive an automatic termination letter. 
Um, so these are all ways that technology is not just about you know, uh, making the workplace more efficient, uh, but also about monitoring and surveillance of workers. And I think that there are several things that New York City can do um, to address some of the privacy issues in the workplace. And I'd be happy to have ongoing discussions uh, with, with the city and the council member about that. Um, as a union uh, that represents our workforce, we aren't opposed to automation. We're not Luddites. Um, we recognize the, the need to automate some of these tasks. Uh, but the fundamental problem here is, is the power imbalance in how technology in the workplace is not only deployed, but also how it's developed. Um, so going all the way back to the university level where you have universities that are working in conjunction with businesses to develop new technologies, workers and workplace consider worker considerations are not at the table at the development stage, which then means by the time we're dealing with it at the rollout, we're all the, already well behind the eight ball and the work and the technology is not designed with uh, workers in mind. Um, and so in collaboration with the national AFL-CIO, we're working to develop relationships at universities to actually begin to think, to be at the table um, on those issues, but then also um, we're beginning to see new language in contracts that says that uh, the rollout of technology will be phased in and it will only come with a negotiation with the union and, and its workers to ensure, so there'll be phase-ins, pilots, and then the determination will be made jointly about how the rollout will happen. So these are really important um, responses, but obviously are uh, small scale given the, uh, the small amount of workers ultimately nationally that are unionized. Um, and so I would think that if New York City wanted to do anything to address uh, the impact of technology on workers, it would do its most to increase the power and the role of workers and worker organizations in the decision making process around technology. Um, so this could include expanding labor peace requirements so that uh, businesses that are receiving subsidies, businesses that are uh, um, you know, on public land, for example, are required to be neutral to unionization. Um, and, you know, and, and businesses that receive tax breaks are actually subject to some of these requirements as well because um, really it's about increasing the balance of power in the workplace. Um, lastly, I'll mention um, that we need a robotics just transition plan. Um, this, you know, there are many ways to frame this. I think it's similar to some of the ideas that were mentioned before. Um, and it couples several pieces. One is a strong social safety net so that workers aren't in fear of losing their job and then can actually participate in the decision making rather than just opposing it. Um, so fear is just a huge issue that this, a stronger social safety net would help to address. Um, and then a retraining fund. Um, you know, the unions currently are the second largest trainer in the country behind the military. Um, yet we see very little collaboration between employers, unions, and the government on actually developing these training pro retraining programs. Um, historically, my understanding is that much training was done by employers. Employers had a uh, self-interest in ensuring a um, well-trained workforce that has significantly dropped off over the years. Um, and what we need to do is re, sort of re-up the commitment of employers to work jointly with unions and the government to, to develop these training programs. Um, I think it was mentioned before, the Jobs for New Yorkers Task Force, which was formed uh, several years ago. Um, really, the, the problem with that is that employers ultimately didn't uh, commit to a collaboration on this issue. Um, and so we had great ideas, but no commitment going forward. So this is the challenge, and thank you for your time. Thank, thank you so very much, and, and, I, and, and I'm glad that for some reason, Josh, we didn't say, I wouldn't say we saved the best for last, because everybody was that, but I think that was, um, there was certainly a dynamic that was miss, missing, that there were a lot of folks talking about the workforce in different ways, but, um, and, and kind of speaking about worker power, but to bring in, um, I would submit time and time again that, that what has sometimes become the order of this body is not responsibilities in the charge of this body and that is to regulate what organized labor does and that the best way to ensure worker protections is, is ensuring the right to organize and the right to collective bargaining and, and, and that was just really uh, defined in, in, in your testimony there. A lot of things that were reminiscent of some of the things that, that we were able to do and even in time.
times of uh, oftentimes in, in maintenance, whether it's a train or a bus being repaired or something like that, that there are time jobs that are negotiated, right? Those are industry standards that have to happen and that um, within negotiations that you were gonna send members out and they're gonna do jobs at X amount of times and not robots or whatever it is. And even if they were, they, they were robots involved, the, the, the amount of time um, that it was going to take that employer that represented member to do the job was was negotiated. It was it, it was done in a way um, that not just was, was was fair and ethical, but it maintained the level of, of safety and humanity in the work as well. And 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 I I, I am I am uh, afraid that that we're losing that. I went into uh, BJ's about two weeks ago. And there was an, a line walking out the door, and all ten of the self checkouts were down, and there were five registers open, and there was absolute chaos, and 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 so um, clearly there are industries that are really being impacted, that um, it is not that smooth of a transition, but at the same time, in order for people to recognize um, that this change is happening. Um, in advance, that is, you know, as I mentioned before, is, is the charge of leadership, and 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 to be able to sit down and negotiate, and and but there are more and more spaces, far more spaces than not, where workers aren't represented, and and what do we do in those cases there? So this is a, a ton of really really good information here. Um, that we've seen, and uh, Zach, just, just for a moment, um, from, from, from an organiza organizational standpoint and the groups that you represent, could you talk to, could you very briefly speak to partnerships outside of, of government, CBOs, and uh, community-based organizations, not-for-profits that you may work with that allows you to reach your target audience a little more efficiently, effectively than government may do? So speaking to outside of what we do with government? So outside of outside government. Outside of government. Who, who do you work with? So um, we, we've partnered with uh, Center for Urban Future on uh, some things. We have partnered with the CS for All nonprofit organization. We uh, help work with uh, um, Girls Who Code, um, it, Coalition for Queens, which is now called Pursuit. We have an ongoing partnership with. And it, a lot of this happens on an ad hoc basis, um, but we're trying to make it more comprehensive, and we're doing some work into that now. Yeah, because even what we do here, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm somewhere and, and the mother will say, well, you know, the kids got nothing to do or this is happening or that. And, and I'm saying, well, you know, I know whether through discretionary initiative or just general funding here, we, we, we put all this money into to workforce development or youth and employment and yada, yada. But ultimately, are we reaching our target audience? And that often doesn't happen through the minutia of government, but happens more organically, locally. And, and so I'm, I'm concerned about relationships and partnerships on, on a more local level. Yeah, and I think something that we've seen is a, a lot of, there's a lot out there. You heard about a lot of different kind of programs at today's hearing. A lot of them are through the government. A lot of them are through nonprofits. And it's hard for a, a individual New Yorker to find what they should do. If I need retraining or I want some kind of skill, I can go online and I can try and find it, but we need to also help people get funneled into the right programs. And that's bridge programs, but that's also just um, better coordination amongst all the different players. And there, there's some movement on that now and trying to get a better comprehensive overview of what an individual New Yorker might have access to and for, uh, for low, low amount of uh, funds and all that. I was going to agree both with you and, and uh, with Zach. I think that one of the things to note about the model of bridge programs and why they're called bridge programs is because they are meant to be that partnership, a link from uh, you know the, uh, a community in need of services to higher education or advanced training, right? Uh, and often bridge programs are actually run by local CBOs 
uh, that don't have the ability necessarily to do advanced technical training or you know, high skill training, but they can give people the foundational skills and then have a partnership with an advanced training entity that they automatically feed people into. And so the bridge program not only addresses those foundational skills for the clients, it also acts as the outreach arm and recruitment arm to get people into the more advanced training programs that they might not find out about at all if they hadn't initially gone for the bridge program. Yeah. Well, thank you to the panel for this has been very, very insightful. Look forward to working with all of you in the future. Uh, um, genuinely working with, with everyone. So feel free. Um, the committee is always available uh, to bounce ideas off of um, whether it is a uh, policy that supports what you do, funding, or whatever else. And, you know, we, we, this is certainly something that we're not taking lightly that we want to be prepared and stay, be able to stay ahead of the curve. So thank you for your testimony. And with that, uh, I want to thank everybody that came out and testified, everybody that joined us in the audience, everybody who joined us online. Obviously, this is a very important uh, topic of conversation that we need to continue to have. We look forward to continuing to have that. But for now, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>